I want to thank Neil for the encouraging word, but I hope I do a little bit better at preaching than I did at basketball. I wasn't the best uh, player there. Um, But speaking of that, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to speak the word of God here today. I take it as a very serious task. It's like wielding a sharp sword. The Bible says that the word of God is a double-edged sword. So every Sunday you have Pastor Billy or one of the other elders up here wielding the sword of the word of God. And it's a powerful sword because it's sharp. So you have to be careful with it. And you have to be very cautious in the way you, you yield it because this is a mighty weapon. So I do take this very seriously. And uh, I'm going to do my best to yield the word of God the right way. And uh, I did have a talk with Pastor Billy about this subject a little bit, and he gave me some guidance. So if I sound a little bit like him, it's not intentional. It's just that, you know, I was, you know, sitting under, sitting under him for a bit, getting some tips and pointers. Um, again, even though I haven't been going uh, to this church very long, I've known some of you, and you know who you are, uh, for many years, and I appreciate your friendship and your fellowship in the Lord. And I just wanted to uh, mention the Larsons for a moment, um, because they have really had a huge effect on my life and uh, have helped me come back to the Word of God and sound biblical doctrine. And uh, one doctrine that they brought up was the doctrine of eternal security. Now, uh, some of you that know me know I'm very passionate about that doctrine, and I'm not going to be talking about that doctrine today, maybe another day, maybe next time. But I just wanted to mention it for a minute, because when I first got saved, the first few years that I got saved, I didn't believe in eternal security. Um, And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just when you come out of a worldly mindset, you have such a works-based mentality that once you get saved, it takes a little while for that mentality to be broken. Um, Also coming from a Roman Catholic background and a works-based salvation, it just, it was hard to kind of get that notion out. I think it's easier and more logical to believe you can lose your salvation because that's sort of the, a worldly position. And I've just begun thinking recently, and I say this with all due respect to those who who hold to a conditional security, that is that you can lose your salvation. And I I believe that genuine Christians hold to that view for whatever reason. Um, I say this with all due respect, but isn't eternal security kind of the gospel? I mean, the fact that Jesus died for our sins, past, present, and future, that's the gospel. How could you not believe that? That's just what the Bible teaches. That is the very essence of the gospel. Now, a lot of people would say that eternal security is a minor doctrine. I disagree. I think it's a major doctrine because what Jesus did at the cross isn't to be played with. But I think you have your major A's and you have your major B's. So you have, I think you have two categories of major doctrines. And as big as eternal security is, I think you can be a true Christian and still hold to a faulty view on that for whatever reason. Um, We know John Wesley was a great preacher and he he believed you could lose your salvation. Um, So I I would say it's a major B, is that if you disagree with that, I would say you're wrong and I would tell you you're wrong and that you really need to search the scriptures. I don't take that lightly. Um, It's not a minor doctrine, but it's not to the point where if you don't believe that, that I would say you're not a Christian. But what I'm, what I'm about to talk about today is a, is a major A. This is a big doctrine that we cannot disagree on. If you are a Christian, you have to hold to this doctrine. And that is the very doctrine that Jesus Christ is God. And, uh, you know, people would ask me what I'd be preaching about, and I would say, well, Jesus. And they're kind of looking at me like, well, yeah, I kind of, would, I kind of figured that. But no, that's really what I'm going to be talking about today, Jesus and the fact that he is God Almighty. And there are many attacks today on the divinity of Christ. Uh, you have the intellectual world, uh, scientists, the Jesus Seminar, and things of that nature, um, demeaning Jesus Christ to be a, a mere man or even non-existent. I don't even know what exactly they say, and I'm not ashamed to say that because it's going to be a bunch of baloney anyway. But you have these people out here demeaning Jesus Christ, And then you have things in the media and the entertainment, uh, like the Da Vinci Code, uh, which has some foolishness about a goddess and that Jesus married Mary Magdalene, and uh, that's, that's nonsense. And then you have 
attacks on the divinity of Christ from the religious world. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, uh, they attack the divinity of Christ. And we'll, we'll be dealing with that today. Um, part of the reason for this sermon is to um, help equip you on how to defend the deity of Christ. And we're going to uh, kind of come in on the frontal against the Jehovah Witnesses more so today. And then even in liberal Christianity, within the spectrum of, of what we call Christianity, there are uh, some denominations and some preachers and some speakers that uh, would not believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead or that he actually is God. So you have a huge attack on the divinity of Christ. Now I'm going to go right into the text. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. And um, Neil had already read the passage, and, and he's right. This is the cult's nightmare. This is the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons' nightmare. And um, I'm going to begin uh, at verse 1. We're just going to kind of take this apart. Um, God who it, this is Hebrews 1, verse 1. I'll give you a minute to get there. It says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, what I'd like to point out here is verse 3. Remember, we're talking about the fact that Jesus Christ is God. He's not just a man. He's not just the Son of God. He is God. Now, verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person. So, so there you have a picture that Jesus Christ is the express image of God. That's pretty strong language. When I, when I look in the mirror, what am I looking at? I'm looking at my image. That's me reflecting back to me. So Jesus Christ is the express image of God. Now that's strong language right there. And if you look at that word and what it means in the Greek, um, it talks about being an exact representation or an exact copy, which is we read from the NIV this morning. That's what, how the NIV translate it. So Jesus Christ is an exact copy of God. Now that pretty much settles the case right there. Here you have an exact copy, an exact representation of God Almighty. That's what the scripture says that Jesus Christ is. Let's keep going. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So not only is Jesus Christ an exact copy of God, we see that, he's better than the angels. The scripture makes it clear he's so much better than the angels. So we can't say that he's just a mere angel. And that is what the watchtower, the watchtower is the Jehovah Witness headquarters. The watchtower teaches that Jesus Christ was Michael the archangel. He's a created being. That's what the watchtower teaches. But here we see in scripture that Jesus is better than the angels. So how can he be an angel if he was made so much better than them? Now here I imagine the Jehovah Witness might say, well, oh yes, he's, he's better than the angels. He's the best of the angels, but he's still an angel. And if we were to stop there, uh, maybe you'd have a point. But as you'll see as we keep going, Scripture will completely dismantle your argument in just a few moments. Um, so let's keep going. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So here we see scripture saying that Jesus has a unique relationship with God, a relationship that nobody else has. He's the unique son of God. Now yes, if you're a Christian today, we're, we're sons and daughters of God but not in the same way that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He has a unique relationship with the Father. And the Father is asking here, For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. So the writers of Hebrews rather are saying, 
has God ever referred to the angels as his son? No, the answer is he hasn't. But to Jesus, he does. To Jesus, Jesus is the unique son of God. Now here the Jehovah Witnesses will probably gladly say, yes, Jesus is the son of God. We, don't, we believe that. We believe he's the son of God. We believe he's the best of all God's creation. Well, he is the son of God, but he's so much more than the son of God. He is God Almighty, and in the next few verses, we're going to see that. Now, verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Now, here you have, see, it's, it's just getting harder and harder for, for the Jehovah Witness or for the person who wants to deny the divinity of Christ. They keep throwing out these arguments, but Scripture just keeps cutting them up. It, it just keeps getting stronger. Let all the angels of God worship him. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So the angels of God are worshiping the Son of God. They're worshiping Jesus Christ. How can you be an angel and be worshiped by angels? If you were just a mere angel, why are other angels worshiping you? Furthermore, the scripture says, and it's all throughout, that God alone is worthy of worship. God alone is worthy of worship. So the Jehovah Witnesses have a problem here. If angels are worshiping Jesus, and Jesus isn't God Almighty, then they're committing idolatry, and Jesus would be committing sin for receiving worship when he's not God, because God will share his glory with no other. So if Jesus isn't God and he's being worshipped, they have a fundamental problem here. What's the only reasonable solution? I mean, we either got to conclude that um, God would allow Jesus. I'm assuming, I'm going with the Jehovah Witness viewpoint. There's Jehovah, who's God, and then there's Jesus, who isn't God. So it would seem here, trying to understand that God's allowing Jesus to be worshipped. But if Jesus isn't God, that contradicts God when he says that I alone am worthy of worship. So there's some kind of duality going on here. There's something that doesn't make sense. Or maybe the angels and Jesus were in absolute rebellion under God's nose and he had no idea that they were, there was some sort of idolatry going on. I mean, we know the angels are without sin. We certainly know Jesus is without sin. The only thing that would make sense is that Jesus is God. That's the only way you can make it make sense. Well, now you have a problem. Some would say, well, you have Jesus as God, and God is God, and you seem to have two gods. Could this be a hint at the doctrine of the Trinity, that there's God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which this verse doesn't talk as much about the Holy Spirit, but he certainly is God, and that would be a whole nother sermon. So what we have here is Jesus, the Son, God the Son being worshipped. That's what we have. And because Jesus is God, he can be worshipped without it being in violation of God alone is worthy of worship. Because if Jesus is God, then he's worthy of worship. Now I know it's kind of hard to understand, but that's the doctrine that we call the Trinity. That there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And of the angels he saith, who make his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So clearly there, the angels are ministers, they're servants. But listen to this. This is unbelievable, and this nails it in the coffin. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. Now this is absolutely amazing. Here is God Almighty. See, a lot of times the Jehovah Witnesses will say, that, well, Jesus called the Father God. Well, yes, he did, but the Father also called Jesus God. You see it right here. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. You you have to be something spectacular for God to call you God. You, You can't, God would not call anybody here God. He might be impressed with us or his creation, but you have to be Pretty extraordinary for the creator of the universe, God Almighty, to actually call you God. 
You have to be God. So here we have God calling the Son of God, God. And not only is he calling the Son of God, God, look at the way he says it, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. It's almost in a sort of uh, reverence. The Father's like, this is God saying, your th- this is the Father saying to the Son, your throne, God, is forever. Not only is he addressing him as God, he's addressing him as having a throne that is forever. So you have a most amazing thing here. You have God referring to the Son as God who has a throne, who will be on it forever. And the verse goes on to say, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, scepter's, you know, a staff, a sign of rule. So the Father, again, is is telling the Son that you rule, you reign forever. You have a kingdom. So I, I just can't, this is just a, this verse right here we could bank on all day because you have, and this is the verse that uh, one of them, I, I really began to doubt the deity of Christ in my life. I was raised Roman Catholic and then later I became a, a born-again Christian. So all my life I've been told that Jesus is God and I'm just, am I just believing what I've been told? No, I'm going to search the scriptures. And, and here you have it clear. You have God referring to another individual as God. What is going on here? So here you have two individuals. You have two persons. And one is referring to the other as God. And the amazing thing about this is, this verse is an Old Testament verse being quoted again in the New Testament. You please write down Psalm 45, verse 6 to 7. You will find the two verses, this verse and the next verse I'll deal with, in the Old Testament. So this isn't a New Testament creation. This Verse existed hundreds of years before Christ even came. So again, what we're beginning to see here is God referring to another individual as God. And no, you don't have two gods. The Bible doesn't teach that, but it teaches one God and three persons. And there's a hint to that in the Old Testament. You don't have to go there, but um, please write this scripture down. Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our own image. Why is God speaking in the plural? Why didn't he say, let me make man in my image? He's saying, let us make man. This must have drove people nuts back in the day. What's going on there? Well, no, there's a plurality to God. And as we, this is the book of Genesis. As we keep going in Scripture, we see that that is developed and that God actually consists of three persons. And, and that, that is clearly, the, the word Trinity is never in Scripture, but the doctrine is very much there. So now if we go to verse 9, back to Hebrews. Thou hast loved righteousness and hateth inequity. Therefore, God, even thy God, had anointed thee, with, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now here again, you have a most amazing thing. You have the Father, God, again referring to Jesus as God, but also addressing himself as God to Jesus. So you have the Father calling Jesus God, while at the same time saying, I am your God. So it would seem that the Father is God to Jesus, and Jesus is God to, the, God, to, God to the Father. Now, there's only one God, but there's God the Son and God the Father. And I don't see uh, how this could be illustrated more clearly and more beautifully. God is telling Jesus, therefore God, he's addressing Jesus as God, even your God. So he's acknowledging that Jesus is God, but he's not taken away from the fact that he is God. Now again, what do we have here? Two gods? No. The scripture says there's only one God. But we know from scripture that there are three persons in the Godhead. Um, the best illustration I, I, I've, I've heard to illustrate that was the number three. A lot of times people will say water because water can be ice, water can be uh, the liquid, and water can be um, vapor. Um, that's a fair illustration, but it kind of tends to promote modalism and in modalism is the view that God changes forms. He's the Father at one time, and then he becomes the Son, and then he becomes the Holy Spirit. Well, that's heresy. That's not true. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all at once. 
So the best illustration I've heard of that, and, and Pastor Billy actually gave me this, is the number three. The number three, there's only one number three, but it consists of three ones. That's the best illustration that I have. But you know what? We don't need an illustration because Scripture makes it fairly clear that this is the way it is. And then verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Here God is telling Jesus, you created everything. He's acknowledging to Jesus Christ that he is the creator. This is the creator referring to someone else as the creator. So I'm giving you these verses because I I want you to write these down and I want you to be sure of the fact that Jesus Christ is God. You see, the Jehovah Witnesses believe that um, God created Jesus and they actually do believe Jesus created Jesus. The universe. I, I, they do believe that, but they believe God created Jesus and then that Jesus created all other things. In fact, they twist uh, uh, Colossians and put other in front of all things. So they believe that God created Jesus and that Jesus created all things. Well, again, Scripture is going to completely dismantle that argument. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 1. And this is probably one of the most famous verses about the divinity of Christ. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, Suppose we, we, you know, we, most of us may know what the word refers to, but let's just pretend we, we have no prior knowledge here, and let's just take this text for what it says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we have this word that was in the beginning, whoever it was. This word, whoever it was, we know was in the beginning, Okay, uh, so we, that's established. This word was in the beginning. 